So good morning, everybody. Doug Farr, you heard my introduction a few minutes ago. Um, I'm a little husky voiced this morning. Um, uh, I was inducted into the American Institute of Architects College of Fellows last night. So we were on Michigan Avenue partying it up till about midnight. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm suffering a little bit this morning, but delighted to be here. Thanks to the university. Thanks to Emily. Uh, for having me. So I bet well uh, that Andres would focus on ideas rather than projects, and so uh, we're in good shape. Emily posed me this question earlier this week. I said, you know, Emily, what am I supposed to talk about? She said, you know, Doug, talk about whether I, neighborhoods matter, right? Do they matter? Are they relevant? And they matter. Here's my answer. Yes. But there's an asterisk, and um, I'm going to talk about this three different ways. But uh, you know, as Andres said, I think the gold standard is that five-minute neighborhood. When you add environmentalism as it's practiced today, scale really does matter. Sometimes that five-minute, you know, circle is the right size. A lot of times it's not, and so I want to talk about that. I'm going to talk about it three different ways. Sustainable urbanism, <clears throat> which is really a, a kind of a 20-year march now at Far Associates uh, here in Chicago, and our practice and the uh, work we've done to integrate sustainability at the urban scale. Lead neighborhood development, which I championed and chaired uh, over a number of years, which is the lead world's response to the neighborhood. And then what may well have been Steve Jobs' last project before he died, I Neighborhood. Okay. So sustainable urbanism, first one. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we are downtown. We're in the Monadnock building. We're in Chicago. Uh, we're working on the hair school down here, really. Uh, Delighted to be back in Hyde Park. Um, but over one of the things that distinguishes our practice, the, the timeline behind me is the fact that we do about half buildings and half planning, right? So we sort of toggle back and forth. And we're co constantly misunderstood as either, oh, I thought you only did planning. I thought you only did architecture. We do both. And so it is a, a rich opportunity that we have. Uh, and it's timely when the topic of sustainability comes up because buildings were first. They were first by almost 15 years in terms of engaging on the topic of sustainability, that is to say architects, the building industry, and so on. So a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today are applying the lessons learned at the scale of the individual building to the neighborhood. And so pretty fun stuff. We, uh, the story has a kind of aha moment back some time. Um, we uh, did this TOD plan, Transit Oriented Development Plan for the west side of Chicago, uh, a depopulated lower income neighborhood probably like a neighborhood that maybe researchers here at the university study. Um, and we proposed this TOD. And it's um, back in 98, we didn't have apparently money enough to buy bright colored pencils, so we <laughs> rendered it in drab green and drab brown. Uh, but basically what you're seeing is the reinsertion of the neighborhood center for in a neighborhood that had one a long time ago, but hadn't had one recently. And it's buildings organized around a park uh, right next to a transit stop. So that was the kind of aha, that was the kind of basis of the aha I'm about to tell you about. We then got commissioned by what we thought was Ma Mayor for Life, Richard M. Daly, to design the city's first lead anything. City of Chicago went on to be the world leader in green buildings. This was where it started, its flagship, Chicago Center for Green Technology, 445 Sacramento. And we were given an open checkbook and a mandate to just get to lead platinum. Why? The mayor heard it was best, and the mayor wanted the best. So we did just that. And so it was repurposing an existing building from 1952. No great shakes, the building. But we used it, we were directed to use it as a absolute show showpiece for everything we could think of to put in a single building to try it out. The city was willing to be the R&D pioneer. <clears throat> and, uh, and here's some of the results. One of the insights from the green building movement that we apply at the scale of planning is something called integrated design. Integrated design. Simple idea is that you're not trying to optimize, by analogy, the carburetor in the car. You're trying to optimize the whole thing. So in a building, you're trying to get elements of a building that do multiple things for you. So on the left, for example, the solar panels on the south face of the building 
uh, generate electricity, but also shade the window so that heat is admitted when you want it and not when you don't. In the foreground, uh, the pond there happens to store stormwater, but beneath it is also our heating and cooling, our thermal sink for the heating and cooling. Um, and so that pond is doing two things, integration. On the right is uh, what you probably grew up calling a ditch. Uh, we learned to call a bioswale. Um, and your, I learned your billing rates go up if you call it a bioswale. So uh, that worked pretty well. But another example of integration, and, and I think probably the threat that Andres aptly describes it as is this notion that somehow a ditch suddenly applies across a city and that that's a good idea. So you'll hear, hear more about that sort of threat again. So we had the TOD project and then the green building project on adjacent desks in our studio. And I had this sort of aha moment to say, goodness, isn't it interesting? I think of these as both really sustainable projects, the TOD, the retrofit of a neighborhood on the west side, and this high performance building have nothing to do with each other. There's absolutely no overlap in the Venn diagrams. So we went back, we bought some brightly colored pencils and re-rendered the first one to include all the lessons from the building. And so you see here essentially green bling, right? Green roofs, photovoltaics, and then a rethinking of that park to be an instrument of common infrastructure. The, the geothermal would happen under the park, the, the streets would capture their stormwater and put it back into the, into the soil there, and so on. So this vision of an integration of bigger systems. And we were smitten. So we started delivering this, this uh, style, this thinking, this philosophy to projects for our clients, and they hated it. So, so here's the Regional Transit Authority, RTA, commissioned us to do a downtown plan for South Suburban Orland Park. We turned it in, there's the green bling, you can see the solar panels and the bioswale street that has a, it's actually a divided median street of perfectly fine urban street typology, but the center median is depressed to capture the water. Turned it in, they said we love the plan, except what's all that green stuff, please take it off. So then we went up to 40, Minneapolis, 46th and Hiawatha, did another TOD there back in 99, and it was a hellacious fight about density. So Andres's point is well taken. People, you, some people like it, but if you're not a neighbor, you hate it for the most part. But we asked at the end of a, a, you know, a, a long and arduous planning process if we made the buildings there green, 1999, not defined, lead was not, didn't exist yet. Could we make them all one story taller? And the answer was yes. And that was kind of dollar signs to a developer. It was an interesting kind of uh, insight to planners and so on. The idea that if you take urban and density and green, they seem, seem somehow to travel better together. Um, Closer to home, uh, uh, normal Illinois, we did this master plan in 1999 um, for uh, the downtown district. And again, you can see there's, we're just carrying forward the kind of same ideas, trying them in uh, each project. In this case, the town of normal Illinois, a very, you know, place that by virtue of its name has to try harder, uh, you know, picked it up, right? And so we proposed at the center of it was a neighborhood center, essentially a circle. Uh, and this circle did stormwater filtration. So it was that two diagrams ago finally kind of illustrated out and, and built. So this is the idea that you catch the water off the buildings and off the streets, filter them, and present them back for human delight. And so this was finally finished in 2010. Um, there was a heck of a fight with traffic engineers about whether or not human beings ought to occupy the center of what they declared uh, a roundabout, that they thought that the higher and better use of that was as a free zone in case a driver lost control of their car to give the, the car and driver time to recover. So it was kind of a rural highway condition they were trying to apply in a city, and so we lost two years fighting that fight. Um, the other thing was the idea that you could actually, as a designer, we are instructed never to put more than a quarter inch deep water in public because no one can drown in a quarter inch. And so this was also viewed as radical, the idea that humans would delight in water. Now, who grew up, you know, playing in puddles in the street? You know, that's illegal. You can't do that. So, so here's parents delightfully watching their children play in what should be illegal, right? And here's... Um, college students uh, with brewskis and, uh, you know, foot-generated air conditioning, uh, you know, sort of delighting 
in all of that. And so we um, finally got it approved by calling this thing a circular intersection. This place we designed got the 2011 award for the best new civic space in America. That was pretty cool. Uh, but the greater kind of gotcha was when the Federal Highway Administration, the people that fought us for two years on permitting it, gave us their highest award. So at the end of all this, this is practice. This is a little bit sharing kind of battles from the front, which is just because you want it, you can't necessarily have it. Um, here was the definition that we figured out we were calling now sustainable urbanism, walkable transit served urbanism integrated with high performance buildings and high performance architecture. Admittedly, a very physical design, bricks and mortar, pipes, wires, places, facades, streets, blocks, neighborhoods kind of approach, but that's what we do. And it became this book with a forward by uh, yes, our prior speaker, Andres, graciously wrote a, a cover of a forward. So I want to share with you. So we wrote the book to summarize what we were doing for ourselves. And then it grew and it grew and it grew. We got a lot of co-authors and contributors. And then we had a call for case studies. And I'm sort of laying the groundwork. Thank you. I will go further quickly. Thank you. Um, the case studies included the insight that this integration seemed to be able to occur at many scales, some of them smaller than a neighborhood and some of them many scales of a neighborhood. A couple of my favorites, Bedzed in England is only four acres, set its target to um, deliver high quality living within the constraints of an ecological footprint, essentially the car carrying capacity of the earth. That's what it looks like. It's got all kinds of swell innovations in the time today, I won't go through it, but there's your diagram of that system integration where the water that falls on the roof is used, of course, to flush toilets. It's not conveyed away in a sewer pipe and brought back to you in another sewer pipe and travels 10 miles. No, it travels from the roof to your toilet and stuff like that. District energy systems, many of which failed due to scale. They were too small. So the neighborhood, in this case, would have been the right scale. And here's their sort of, uh, you know, uh, what do you call uh, rainbow-colored list of 10 attributes that together make up the one planet living protocol. The punchline here that was interesting is, and this is driven by an environmental group, that they, their goal was to get to one ecological footprint when the UK average is three and a half. And they got to about 1.2 uh, ecological footprints which is pretty darn good. And they also studied the heck out of everything, like you know, impacts and so on. Concluded that 63% of that reduction came from bricks and mortar stuff, solar panels, insulation, and so on, and 37% changes in conduct. And to me, that's a worthy, that's a worthy you know, thing to study down here. There's another project I liked also, Dockside Green, that made the, the, the book um, uh, an exemplar actually inspired by Bedzed, 15 acres in Victoria, BC. There's a lot of attributes uh, here, and I'll just focus on one. At 15 acres, the plan was to uh, do sewage treatment right through the middle of this project. And what you have, what, what the rendering shows is what's the f kind of the fourth, the quaternary treatment level, the polishing phase of, of sewage treatment was run right by the townhouses. Um, and guess what? This thing paid for itself because you could now charge a real estate premium for being in front of a water feature. Pretty cool. And so here, here it is built, and uh, it was a $100,000 premium people were willing to pay to have that little kind of uh, modernist balcony with the little lip down and the kind of pond. There's you know, koi, koi f swimming around and uh, no sewer smell and so on. So this incredible inversion of expectations of please keep it away from me. No, 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 let me pay you a premium to have it next to me, right? So through design and sustainability and beauty and celebration, there's money to be made. You can integrate more stuff than you'd ever imagine and so on. So sustainable neighborhoods, uh, Emily and Andres referred to the history of the diagrams. Um, we steal Perry, DPZ stole Perry, we stole DPZ, and here's the one that we did for the book, The Sustainable Neighborhood. And it's, it's you know, time doesn't really permit it to say, to say, go through all the details, but the book Sustainable Urbanism was devoted to understanding the patterns, the rules of thumb for designing a sustainable neighborhood, the relationships 
rooftops to a corner store in the modern age, land area devoted to storing stormwater, all, you know, how many houses do I need to support a share car or a share car fleet, those kinds of questions. So the designer is equipped to do it. Now this isn't abstract, this is a current project on the boards for us in Austin, Texas. We're designing a, a 208 acre master plan for uh, an infill site down there. And what is our starting point? Yes, you guessed it, the five minute neighborhood. So they are absolutely essential to our work and was well received in Austin and kind of not, not really on their radar screen as such. We also uh, draw our radii to encompass adjacent neighborhoods. And we say that we of, often say that we are completing a neighborhood. So we're not, not autonomous, we are sort of gluing on half. And the results can be pretty spectacular. Here's one of the more complete neighborhoods uh, in this plan. And it's a good kind of fine grain urbanist uh, plan, which also is 100% solar compliant, which is not kind of a, the monoculture of row crops that you often see in solar solar projects, and here's what the neighborhood center would look like. So the, the young lady is sitting, uh, I think it's coffee, uh, in the morning looking down at the neighborhood center and admiring the skyline views from the park. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. Ooh, that graphic has gone sideways. I apologize for that. But uh, we have taken the One Planet principles and as I was discussing uh, this morning, inverted them. So they usually start with carbon. In this case, we started with happiness. And I think the neighborhood is actually a unit of happiness. It's the right scale for happiness. And so that's a pretty powerful thing. Also, equity and fair trade, it's a place for jobs. So lead neighborhood development is the next thing I want to talk about. I, uh, because our clients were not receptive to the kinds of things that we wanted to do, integrating sustainability at the scale of the big project, I undertook a mission to make a new lead standard. And it fills a niche. We often think of sustainability as a series of objects, uh, the light bulb, the Prius, the super green building. Um, if you don't know what the Bullet Foundation Center in Seattle is the one to Google, it's, it's all that, right? But in the day, lead was about buildings, right? And so, um, and it got a lot of things wrong. You know, this building could be a lead platinum building. And, it would ask the question, is the escalator efficient? Not is it stupid, but is it efficient, right? And then it got other things wrong. Like you could, this was 30% uh, of the schools that certified under LEED were examples like this one in West Brazos, Texas, where there was an old walk to neighborhood school that was replaced with a new drive to school out on the highway. And the new school got the LEED plaque with a kind of footnote about how virtuous it was that the large parking lot that the school now had captured and filtered all its stormwater when the old school didn't have a parking lot. So you can get things really wrong relative to scale. So Lead ND happened. It asks three questions. Where are you working? Where is the place you're talking about? Um, is it a neighborhood? Essentially, that's the middle one. What is it? Uh, and then how is it built, which is the buildings and infrastructure parts. And if you want to know about this, there's a whole industry and apparatus uh, for another day to talk about. There are four uh, lead ND projects hereabouts. One is in, that we've been in, we far associates have been involved in. One down in Riverdale, uh, certified in 2010. Southworks, which I think is maybe some, there's some ties between the researchers here at the university and Southworks. Uh, was uh, literally 200 times larger than the one in Riverdale um, and does not follow the neighborhood structure but is a pretty interesting project. Maybe we could talk about it. Harper Court, I think one of the developers, Chris Dillian, is here. I saw him earlier. There he is. Um, old rendering, sorry, I should have gotten the new stuff, but Harper Court is a lead ND and that's a neat flagship for uh, the University and for Hyde Park, and then we're working on Lathrop Homes on the north side. All four of these are lead ND, and we can maybe talk about them later on. Now, finally, <clears throat> I neighborhood. So Steve Jobs died three years ago, and little known to uh, most people was that there was a kind of a little secret project going on at Apple. If you can see it here, here's the homepage, shop, Mac, iPad, iPhone, I neighborhood. <clears throat> Welcome to our neighborhood. Learn how Apple is bringing their world-class user experience and seamless integration of hardware and software to a neighborhood near you. Pretty cool, huh? So what is this? Apple 
saw the neighborhood as its next project, its next product. And we can see how this could work, like the product, products like the Nest thermostat is this intuitive, lovable, my wife and I have one, we address it each morning, good morning, Nest, how's it going? So we just have this love and feel, and the endorphins rush being in the proximity of the thing the way it does being in an Apple store. So what if a whole neighborhood were that? A neighborhood designed to make meeting daily needs on foot and bike a delight. This is not the federal government cracking a whip and telling you you shall walk and steal your car and so on. So, so what could this be? So it might be, here's a diagram. Um, so this is not actually an Apple product of any type. I've made that part up <laughs> to get you to this point. But what if we got, what if all of the systems in a neighborhood were so well integrated and so intuitive and so delightful, information flowed and so on, that you loved, you loved your life? That's, that's the kind of punchline. So this was actually work we did, uh, we Far Associates in conjunction with a couple of Northwestern folk, folk for APEC, the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation, a commission we had to study Asian and a, you know, Pacific Rim cities of the future. And so it's this incredible model of integration and it has, I'll just take you through the last couple of slides. It views a city as a series of pairings of things that need to work together at different scales. Land use and mobility is one of the most fundamental pairings within the CNU, within planning, should be within planning and so on. The neighborhood is smallish on the scale of things. Cities and corridors are often uh, you know, as useful, but the neighborhood is the delivery vehicle for walking. So that makes a terrible lot of sense. Water systems. Water systems really scale to the municipal ownership or the land parcel that you're working with. So if it happens to align with the neighborhood that you're planning, you got it, but oftentimes not. There's this pesky thing called a watershed which can subdivide a neighborhood, and so ped sheds and watersheds are sometimes in conflict. Energy systems. Energy systems are regional. They are administered by um, you know, lifetime granted monopoly utilities and are really hard to claim back. There's a movement called eco-districts uh, and we're trying to pioneer this same approach up at Lathrop on the north side. So if anybody has any interest in that or talking about it, I'd love to. And I'll just say, since the time we did these diagrams, I've actually come to believe that energy and water should stack. That should be a pairing rather than a standalone. Uh, and then finally, equity and information. I think information has, you know, the neighborhood is not necessarily an optimal scale for information unless it's a Steve Jobs I neighborhood situation where the residents, occupants, everyday users of it have some kind of app or special access to see through walls and understand what's coming and what's around them, in which case it's actually pretty exciting. And then equity, I think, is a, an issue that the university studies a lot. And there's a long conversation to have about how the neighborhood can be a unit of fostering equity. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you.